Uh, and now I will introduce Luis de Miranda. Luis is an international philosopher and author of nonfiction and fiction. His books, Artificial Intelligence and Robotics, or his novel, Who Killed the Poet, has been translated into 10 languages. Being a neonest, was published by MIT Press in, in 2019 and Ensemblance by Edinburgh University Press in 2020. Luis de Miranda is an affiliate researcher at the University of Örebro in Sweden. There he initiated the QUIA group, which is a cross-disciplinary res research on effectual anticipation. And from January from 2021, Luis will, will move to Uppsala University to do research and teaching at the new Center of Medical Humanities in the Department of History of, of Sciences and Ideas. And we wish him the best of luck in, in, in this new challenge. Luis, thank you very much for joining us today. You have the floor. Thank you. So, I'll try to start with reminding us that um, we are celebrating philosophy, which is sometimes considered as something old. And in fact, philosophy is new, and I would even say that it's twice new. It is new because if we look at the, the evolution of life and the evolution of humanity, um, it is not so long ago that we have reached this uh, paradigm in which we are capable of thinking about the whole in ways that uh, can be shared, evaluated, discussed, and not only in terms um, of faith, or dogma. But more interestingly for our question of health, I think that philosophy is new in the sense that there is something that can be called philosophical health. And this is what I will try to do in the next uh, uh, 15 minutes is explain what do I mean by philosophical health. We usually know what is physical health. We know what is mental health, at least there is, although there are more de many debates about it, there is, there is a field, there is an institutional uh, field uh, called mental health. But when we go back in time, not so long ago, in fact, both physical health and um, psychological health were a luxury for the happy few at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, very few people had access to psychoanalysis, for example, or uh, to systematic uh, training of the body or, 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 or diet. And my view is that philosophical health, which has been uh, since the, uh, the ancient Greeks, a privilege for the happy few can be now democratized and hopefully by the end of this century, we might uh, engage with the idea of philosophical health uh, in a way that is beneficial for the entire society globally. So the contribution I'd like to make is to present what I think are five values uh, representative of uh, philosophical health or five ideals. And the first one is mental heroism. And you will see that everything, these five uh, uh, principles are in fact known since the ancient Greeks. And, uh, and I will be following here uh, several analyses that have been presented uh, first and foremost by Pierre Adol in his rereading of philosophy as a way of life rather than a pure abstract uh, ivory tower endeavor. And also uh, Foucault in his uh, studies of the care 
of the self or of the soul. So indeed, it takes extreme courage to think as independently as possible. And this has been a thread all, all over the history of philosophy. We find it not only with the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, but also with Kant, who proposed actually three maxims in his anthropology uh, for practical wisdom, what he called practical wisdom. And those maxims are think for yourself, think into the place of the other in communication with human beings, and always think consistently with yourself. So here we see already that mental heroism is not only about being able to resist resiliently the influences of, of the opinion, uh, the fears, the collective fears uh, of which we do have an example today, for example. It is also being capable of intellectual empathy, which is something quite different from emotional empathy. But more importantly, mental heroism is about a coherence between what we think, our beliefs, our system of values, our worldview, and what we do. And in this sense, it is not only a world of ideals, but it, it, is, it has to do with orientation in life. And that's the second principle, deep orientation. It's not only about having courage, it is also about discovering what is our path, what is our way, and trying to be faithful to uh, our highest values, where those values may be uh, truth, uh, honesty, or, 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 or uh, justice, for example. And what philosophy has been arguing uh, since um, uh, the uh, ancient Greeks is that when we follow a deep orientation which starts with ideation indeed it has an incidence into our social life into reality there is a correspondence between ideas and acts and ideas are social forces therefore our ideas are embedded in a network of responsibility. So of course, this is closely tied to the notions of uh, human flourishing by which individuals aspire to free themselves from uncontrolled beliefs, automatic fears, bellicose impulses, dogmas, or lack of mastery over their personal destination. Now, this has to do with the fact that philosophy is ideally not dogmatic in the sense that it doesn't pretend to know what the truth here and the figure here of course is Socrates. It is philosophy, it is a love of wisdom as an ideal that is a dialectic ideal, that is an idea that allows for uh, creativity and critique, respectful critique. And that's the third principle, critical creativity. So here it's important because in critical, we have the Greek root crisis, crisis. And I was born in 71. And since then, I've always heard that we've been in crisis. So for my generation, uh, it's just crisis after crisis according, of course, uh, to, uh, to the media or other uh, mainstream readings. But we have forgotten that crisis, crisis in Greek, doesn't mean crisis in the sense uh, that we have it, it, it now, catastrophe. It means judgment. It means the capacity to uh, discriminate uh, from wanted elements, from unwanted material. And it was used in, by doctors, actually, uh, in the medical realm. Uh, 
in order to designate the moment, the critical moment where um, a condition might evolve for better or worse. And why do I connect critique with creativity? Well, because the ideal of philosophical health suggests a durably resilient and regular capacity for recreative transformations of critical situations. And in physiology, for example, today, uh, some uh, researchers are talking about not only homeostasis, this sort of equilibrium to which a body would return, but about hyperstasis, about the capacity to create new equilibriums. And we see that in life. And of course, we see that in mind. It is possible uh, for uh, our societies and for our uh, being in the world to create new equilibriums uh, and not always to come back conservatively to uh, old uh, ways. The fourth principle, which is, of course, articulated with the others, uh, there is no uh, uh, sense that the first was higher than the fourth. It's, it's like a circle of, of uh, capacities, is what I call deep listening. And this seems quite self-evident. And yet we do it so rarely. Philosophy, again, since the beginning has been concerned with dialogue and being consonant with the other, with nature and with truth. And that's Kant's second principle, the capacity not only to hold to our truth, but also to have intellectual empathy for other possible truth in a context where philo is more important than Sophie. Friendship in interrogating the world is more important than affirming one dogma over another. And when we speak of listening, of course, here comes the concept that we uh, touched upon in the questions previously, the idea of the unheard of, the openness to hear the singularity, not only of each human being, but also of life itself. Careful listening bears fruits because everything in the universe is interlaced. And that's not a, a, a dogma, that's the very logical position of philosophy. Philosophy is the interrogation of the whole. Philosophy, more precisely, is the care for the whole. In everything that we do, do we care for the whole? We get sometimes so focused in, in uh, producing uh, money or producing a specific, very uh, detailed kind of technology, and we forget the whole. And I think one of the aspects of, uh, I think the positive aspect of what is happening this year is that suddenly we think of the whole. Of course, we think of the whole sometimes in a reduced manner, we think of our nation. Uh, some people go further, they think about the world and some people may even go further and have a cosmological care of uh, the whole. And that vigilance, again, that deep, this listening was also present uh, in uh, ancient philosophy in terms of uh, vigilance and presence of mind and uh, care for what they called physis, uh, which was nature uh, in the sense that nature is absolute possibility. And that's the fifth principle and last principle, absolute possibility. So by absolute possibility, of course, it is not meant uh, this uh, technological neoliberal idea that technology will, will solve everything, that the sky is the limit. Uh, 
in terms of philosophical health, absolute possibility is uh, an a priori intuitive feeling that the, the source of being what Aristotle's called uh, prima mobile and, and, and what uh, Plotinus called uh, the one, that is absolute possibility that gets actualized in a matter or in another locally. And the ways we actualize absolute possibility in co-creation with life, those ways are always contingent. And there, of course, that's where uh, philosophy touches the political. There is not a necessary uh, way of making a world. There are many ways of making a world. And we can interrogate, therefore, through critical creativity, the way our world is now made. Right, so I will finish and conclude by saying that philosophy is um, a care for the whole in the sense that that whole is a creative flux. And in that sense, while we often hear the injunction to get real, uh, as if realism was um, the way history has been evolving, it is not. History is, all the progresses in history are not made by realist people. They are made by what I would call creolist people people who actually prefer to get creole, people who never forget the impossible, the unheard of, and people who are sometimes castigated uh, and criticized for uh, looking at that impossible and desiring it to become real while the realists are telling them, no, look at the numbers, look at the statistics, uh, and, and, and look at all the reification that we are presenting as necessary and which, as we have seen, is not. So I'll conclude by that. I think that philosophers who uh, are a group that is expanding, of course, there's no privilege uh, to think, but they are a new aspect of being in the world. And in that sense, we can all start to practice uh, more so uh, that we have in the past, philosophical health as something that will come as a complement to physical health and uh, psychological health. With the audio? Thank okay, thank you very much, Luis. Thank you, really, uh, for your excellent and critical thoughts. Uh, you went directly to the essential point, I think, and it was great and brilliant. And brilliant. Thank you again for your profound and meaningful speech. Now I'd like to invite the, the audience to make their comments and questions to our speaker. And also I may invite the other speakers to ask questions. You can ask questions each other between you. Between you. Thank you, Luis. I, we have one question from Russia. And the first one, uh, first Sofia is thanking you. Uh, he, she says, for food and for thought and call to mental action. Uh, and she's asking if are not the principles that you have suggested, kind of intellectual virtues first outlined by Aristoteles, now being revised. Exactly. And I, I, I mentioned, so I wouldn't say uh, Aristotle's only. Uh, I would say that uh, from Plato to uh, the Stoics uh, and, of course, uh, Aristotle, there, there is uh, much in, in uh, ancient philosophy that, as I said, has not yet been actualized in society yet. It is still considered as something that we, it's, it's nice, it's, it's a nice training for the mind, but, and of course they are, uh, attempts to, to uh, apply it uh, more so in the last 20 years. But I think the, the, the project is still open for society uh, to uh, 
um, integrate philosophical health. Uh, when I started studying philosophy, uh, it was actually considered almost a disease to study philosophy uh, in, uh, in the early uh, 90s. You, my God, you, you will be out of a job you are totally disconnected from real life, all the cliches about philosophy. And I think this is starting to slowly change now, but the, the, the biggest changes are uh, ahead of us. And for example, one of the practices I, I have along with my research is that I, I do philosophical counseling with individuals and uh, I, I help them uh, reflect about the worldview and engagement in life. And I think we could generalize uh, this practice of philosophical care uh, in many aspects of life. I am starting, for example, to work with a, a, a doctor who is a specialist in spinal cord injury. And we have the individuals who are suddenly, their life is transformed in the sense that suddenly they uh, their, their domain of possibilities in terms of moving is extremely reduced, yet their mind is functioning uh, perfectly. So they have to redefine their life. And the, their way of doing it is uh, through uh, philosophical care. Thank you very much. We have another question. Uh... Well, he's thanking you and he's asking just a question on one of our last points of your, of your very last point, sorry. Could we imagine a Nietzsche without his, his illness? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a very a uh, interesting question. <laughs> and, and indeed, Nietzsche had that concept of great health, which is somehow related with, with some of the principles uh, I've been uh, exposing. Um, I think, despite the romanticism uh, about the fact that it is through uh, overcoming his condition, uh, continuous headaches uh, and, and other forms of uh, uh, impairment that Nietzsche had, there is this romantic view that he was a great thinker because he, he could overcome that. And in a way, uh, if he didn't have that impairments, perhaps he would have simply have been a little bit more lazy. Uh, in life, more in, in existence, it's true that sometimes, and coming back to the conversations I have uh, regarding patients who have spinal cord injury, uh, it is true that sometimes it is through an accident that we wake up from a form of life that might have been immature. Uh, and now what philosophical health would do is that precisely we don't, we don't need to have an accident or to get as sick as Nietzsche had to, uh, to be philosophically healthy. It can be something that can be democratized and, and developed by anticipation, right? Uh, I know there is this um, uh, cliche about philosophizing as something that we do when everything goes wrong. And I would like philosophizing to be something that we do also as everything goes well. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, we have a question from Pedro Gomez. He says, truth, truth isn't always be, isn't an always be, sorry, a major scope of philosophy and not the fear disguised disgust under a pseudo value under a false pandemic. Right, I mean, uh, I haven't read the question, but I think I understand uh, that he means there that there is a consensus today on uh, the pandemic. Uh, and indeed, philosophers are very suspicious of, uh, they are actually I was going to say they're suspicious of pandemics. Well, they are suspicious of consensus because consensus itself is the biggest pandemic. The, contagi the contagion of ideas 
is, is the first pandemic and this has been going on forever. So it would be interesting. And I, I lived in, in Sweden, I live in Sweden and I thought that was the way Sweden was following. Uh, it is to give people the responsibility uh, rather than impose biopolitics and authoritarian rules on them. And I thought this was very healthy. Unfortunately, Sweden has been pressured by the dominant uh, opinion, which is very uh, anxiogenic and is now uh, introducing uh, itself uh, more uh, stringent uh, rules, which are still not uh, obligatory, right? But I think that indeed, uh, philosophical health would allow people uh, collectively uh, to be less controlled by uh, their uh, fears, uh, ideologies, or uh, means uh, of interpretation that might prevent uh, the freedom of thought. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, another question from Sofia from Russia. First of all, she's thanking you for the answer. And she, she has another question. What makes you so optimistic about spreading this philosophical health in the population? The modern world actually resists. It is true that sometimes we may have the impression that we live in an anti-intellectual world uh, where uh, uh, emotionalism dominates. Yet, uh, through my practice of philosophical counseling, I have discovered uh, through my great gratitude that much more of us than we think uh, are willing to consider that to think is as important as it is to breathe. And the traditional uh, separation that we made, for example, between emotions and thinking uh, is fallacious. I mean, we, we know that thinking is also a feeling uh, through intuition, for example. So I am optimistic because I've experienced in my life uh, that every time that I have applied those principles, uh, although I might have done it in a way that was not as explicit as now, but uh, it was worth it. So to all the people who are philosophically oriented and sometimes might uh, fall into some despair that my God, this world uh, is really anti-intellectual. Anti and sometimes it feels like intellectuals are the persecuted minority of which we talk the less. Uh, to these people, I would say it's worth it. It's worth it because it's healthy and, and that balance between physical, psychological and philosophical health uh, is the way to go. I like your optimism and I admire it. I have to say, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, here we have a question from Jim Pang. Uh, could, please, could Louis, could you uh, please explain a bit more about the relation between the absolute possibility and Aristotle concept of the one? Right, uh, so the concept of the one is, is more uh, uh, present in Plotinus and, and, and Plato. Uh, so I would like to say two things. The first thing is that uh, I made a longer lecture yesterday uh, about the principles and, and I will share the link uh, now to the attendees uh, since it's on, uh, online. Uh, I've also written about that concept of absolute possibility, which I call the creel for short, in the sense that we often speak about the real but since this real as primo mobile here to, to use a expression by Aristotle as, as a first principle or whether we think it is true or not, where it can be a, a, an ethical principle, uh, it is pure multiplicity. 
However, and this I will not uh, develop too much, but it's important to say that this, the question of the multiple and the one was very important for the Greeks, is this idea that on the one hand, yes, we realize that nature, physics, the creole, absolute possibility, it is uh, infinitely multiple, but precisely from a logical point of view, whenever you posit the infinite multiple, you posit the other side of the coin, which is the one. So that's the relationship. And of course, I would take an entire uh, lecture to, to enter into the relationships between the multiple and the one. But it is not a, uh, it is not a, uh, a question for uh, so sophistics. Uh, it is a very uh, political and present question, uh, of course. How do we have a world that is coherent, united, and yet diverse? And that's what the Greeks were uh, already thinking. Perfect. We have a question from Helen Solman. Uh, she's asking, uh, today are health decisions made more a function of medical advances or of society's vision of health? I mean, of course, uh, we know that these decisions are enmeshed in a network of uh, ideological, political, national uh, reasons, and also uh, biomedical reasons, uh, in the sense that, uh, for example, uh, they might uh, rely on statistics. One of the things that uh, philosophy has been uh, uh, saying in the last decade is that we are dangerously becoming a world, and that's uh, related to what I said about realism, we are becoming a world in which numbers uh, are the ultimate uh, um, element for decision, sometimes presented candidly and sometimes presented ideolo ideologically um, as uh, manipulation. It is almost as if, from the point of view of philosophical health, uh, we have, we, this world, the current world should be diagnosed with arithmomania, which is in fact a disease, the disease of counting everything, the disease of thinking that if we have the numbers, if we have the statistics, if we can uh, demonstrate with graphs, then we are going to take a right decision. And this reminds me uh, of, uh, what Hegel said in his time. So in his time, there was this, uh, the, the pseudoscience uh, of um, phrenology, uh, which uh, looked at the brain and the size of the skull, et cetera, to, to uh, uh, infer a discourse about the character of people. Are they going to be criminal or, or not? And Hegel said, well, and this is valid for artificial intelligence today, for example, or for uh, all the analytics uh, and the uh, based on, on numbers. He said, well, even if, and he didn't believe in phrenology, but even if phrenology was right uh, at an instant A, uh, this sort of uh, inference based on data, well, the human being will take a decision tomorrow or now that will totally change and reshuffle uh, this uh, uh, conclusions, this reification uh, of what we think uh, is happening. So I think it's, we can transpose it today. I think that analytic thinking has to be rebalanced, uh, not only with dialectic thinking, uh, but also what I call creolectic thinking, which is related uh, to this idea of, of philosophical health. And there again, uh, I've, I've written about that and I don't think I have time here to, explore, to expose the details. Thank you very much, Luis. And thanks for all your explanations, your, all your answers, which were really clarified. And now we have to move on. Yes. So I would like to uh, read a brief part of a talk I gave actually at UNESCO last year. 
uh, where I was uh, launching the idea of philosophical health. Uh, and this is taken from the, uh, the, uh, the movement I'm uh, um, fostering uh, that you can uh, join in the, on the site philosophical.health. So I'm quoting myself, which is not very uh, humble, but philosophical health will be in the 21st century what physical and psychological health were in the 20th century. At the beginning of the century, it is a luxury for the happy few. By the end of the century, it is a necessity for all. Philosophical health is a state of fruitful coherence between a person's way of thinking and speaking and their ways of acting such that the possibilities for a good life are increased and the needs for self and intersubjective flourishing satisfied. A philosophically healthy individual group or system or protocol ensures that the goals and purposes of the whole are pragmatically aligned with its highest ideals while respecting the sustainable, plural, and creole future of the parties concerned by the processes at stake. Thank you. <laughs>